This episode introduces the compelling possibility of publication as an art object. We will consider how publications and books can be a viable format for artistic presentation that is both expressive and conceptual. We explore how an artist's book is uniquely different from other modes of display that rely on how space plays out differently on the page. We will describe the possible ways and limitations of channeling the book format for artistic projects and presentations, while addressing how traditional boundaries of what defines a publication can be pushed and expanded to better address the specifics of the artistic content. The episode features the conversation with curators Celine Yap and Cheng Jiayun on their project Browsing Copy as they reflect on the process and outcome of challenging a diverse group of artists to think about publications as an outlet for their practices. The key learning points for this episode are How are publications art objects? What are the challenges and advantages of working with the book format? How do we approach publications as an art form in and of itself? Can a book be an artwork? To conceive of a book as an artwork may not be too commonplace. What differentiates an artist book from art books in general may not be that telling. It might be called book art or art book, but in this series, we will use artist books to address the book as an artwork, and art books as the more general term for art publications at large. So, what is an artist book? The simple answer is art in book form. What this means is that the book format becomes the main medium of the artwork, much like how video, photography, canvas, paper, or metal are various means of expressing artistic ideas. It is the careful and creative process of marrying form and content. That allows us to see how a book can be taken as an art object. This is evident in the artist's intention, choice of materials, book layout and design, and so on. The format of books provides much room to experiment. It offers different modes of engagement with the reader, when taking into account factors such as selection, sequencing, mobility, and tactility. With all these in mind, it is actually not all that difficult to imagine the possibility of books as art objects. Be it expressive or conceptual, taking the structure of the book beyond everyday expectations is often the goal of the artist book. Books as an artistic medium. The term artist book is summed up by publisher and bookseller Walter Kunick, who explains. I feel very strongly that an artist's book should be an autonomous artwork, a book by an artist as auteur. Most artworks are encountered through exhibitions in spaces such as a gallery or a museum. This is where art meets an audience over a temporary period of time. However, these traditional formats are usually tied to opportunities for using public spaces and resources. Exhibitions may not be an accessible platform to every creative practitioner. How then do we consider the format of the book, not just as a space to present artistic explorations, but as the very medium itself? Artist books are books or book-like objects that intentionally utilize the form of a book as the work of art in itself. It channels the book as a medium of artistic expression, and takes direct cues from the form or function of a book to inform the presentation of text and images. They are often published in small editions, 
though they are sometimes produced as one-of-a-kind objects. Today, artist books exist at the intersections of visual arts, printmaking, photography, experimental writing, poetry, graphic design, craft, and publishing. The book form also brings a more mobile quality to the experience without sacrificing intimacy. There are a few factors to consider in creating an artist book. Accessibility. Artist books, in its book form, may make art accessible to people outside of the formal context of exhibition venues. Tactility. Additionally, while an artwork is usually only experienced at a distance, books are meant to be touched and their pages turned. The tactility of an artist book and the ability to handle it is an experience unique to the medium. Context of display or collection. Because it is both an artwork and a book, there is also the question of where the artist book might belong should it be collected. Would it make sense in a library or a museum? These are issues that affect the work of artists, practitioners of book arts, curators, museum collection staff, librarians, publishers, and others in the long term who are thinking about where to exhibit and store their work. Facilitating art making. Experimenting and exploring different ways of making art has always been an integral part of artistic production. The book as medium provides yet another possibility of thinking about how an artwork can be received or engaged with by its viewer or reader. Let's dwell a little more on the artistic considerations of the book form. Artists experiment not just with ideas, but also with materials. An artist book is generally interactive, portable, and easily shared. Often the impetus behind the use of the book form is to cross boundaries and defy existing limitations and definitions. It is a medium of expression that allows for, in fact calls for, the combination of several modes of creation. The form of the artist book also becomes especially meaningful as it defines the skin and presentation of the artwork. You can even go beyond the two-dimensional form into three-dimensional form. The book format is able to cater to both flatter and more dimensional modes of presentation. One of the fundamental aspects of the book form are pages. We can think about how pages, with its sequential quality, can simulate a sense of movement. In thinking about pacing and rhythm, time becomes a crucial design element in artworks that unfold and manifest in book form. The sense of movement may not be linear and can also include special folds, foldouts, and even pop-up elements. Through the binding of pages, a book is also able to hold long-form content that can unveil itself over a certain duration, directed through the editorial layout and design. The space on a page also plays out differently. You could consider color, fold, texture, thickness, or the arrangement of content that is printed, written, or even sewn on it. Books as we commonly conceive them tend to be smaller in scale, similar to booklets or paperback fiction books. While these formats work for their purposes, we can also expand our conception of books to think about bulkier, larger, irregular, or oddly sized books. With its familiarity and prevalence, books often come with certain preconceived notions that are rather confined, posing more limitations than possibilities. In an artist book, traditional techniques and expectations of bookmaking can be stretched, pushed, and expanded to better address the specifics of the artistic content. Because of how elastic the book format is, its binding, scale, pages, and cover can all be adapted 
and experimented with to express the nuances of different artistic practices. Since the book format creates an encounter that is intimate and tactile, you may want to consider how the book can be completely handmade. Perhaps also think about the physicality of a book and how it might become a sculptural object. As the artist book requires a more thorough knowledge of the book format, collaborators may be necessary in the process to supplement any gaps in your knowledge related to print production, editorial design, and layout. Speaking to collaborators who are seasoned bookmakers, such as designers and printers, will help you better identify the possibilities that the book format can unlock for your artwork. It is also possible to undertake the endeavor alone and explore how you could sew, draw, write and assemble the different pages and elements of the book by hand. The key thing would be to identify the gaps in your skill sets and knowledge and whether you would require the expertise of another. The process of making a publication may also be enriched by different collaborations. All art making benefits from extending beyond a solitary vision, and you can choose the level or extent that you want your collaborators to be involved. At the same time, it would be important also to consider what your budget can account for and if it can properly accommodate a roster of collaborators who will be contributing labor and effort alongside yourself. It isn't necessary to start from a place of expertise and knowledge. After all, the point of the artist book is to experiment with how viable it can be as a mode of artistic expression for you. Experience and expertise can be accumulated over time with more experimentation. We will now be moving on to the conversation segment of this episode with curators Cheng Jiayun and Celine Yap on their project Browsing Copy that seeks to advance the artist's book as an alternative site for artistic presentation and consumption. They will discuss more about the considerations and challenges behind the collaborative processes that shape browsing copy. Hi, welcome to the conversation component to Art Books, A Beginner's Guide. This episode looks at art books as art objects. Today with us are Celine. Hello. And Jia Yun. Hi. They are here today to share a little bit about their 2019 project, Browsing Copy. First, uh, could you give us a bit of background about what you do? Um, I'm a curator at the National Gallery of Singapore, um, where I focus primarily on art in Singapore and Southeast Asia after the 1970s. Uh, and I'm an assistant curator at the Singapore Art Museum uh, Contemporary Art Institute. What led you both to the Browsing Coffee project? <laughs> I think I think it's um so Darren and myself have been working on on um, I wouldn't say projects. I think previously we worked on Opening Day, which was also a, a independent um, project. With that project, uh, we were very interested in querying ideas of space uh, in Singapore and its kind of attendant uh, limitations and costs. Mm -hmm. So the project uh, Browsing Copy actually is a kind of continuation of uh, those concerns. Um, we're very much interested at the time of making Browsing Copy in investigating the page as an alternative space or site um, for uh, well encountering um, artistic ideas. And um, for Browsing Copy, we decided to work with eight artists mm -hmm. who whose practices have been developing or have been based in Singapore um, for many years or even artists whose uh, practices are actually still emerging as well. Yeah, I think we were, um, like what Diane mentioned, we were interested in alternative model of artistic production uh, and also I think through the, the book as a more portable form or a more private form, um, so trying to I wouldn't say investing it, but I would just say trying to explore mm -hmm. together with the artists the possibilities of that. Um, yeah, and I, it was also kind of something that we were looking at because we were interested in thinking about perhaps more like this economical um, modes of production. But then, as we will share later, it, it, it 
differed quite a bit from what we were imagining on or understanding of it. Yeah. Yeah. What are some qualities of art books that you personally enjoy yourself? Um, I think it's really, you know, this idea that the, the art book really um, inverts the parameters that you usually uh, expect from encountering an artwork within uh, the context of an exhibition. Um, you know, a book is a much more kind of intimate and almost uh, uh, private or personal encounter. And, you know, the parameters for making um, can potentially, I think, overlap with uh, the making of artworks, but at the same time, you know, set up a whole different um, kind of a set of parameters or limitations or assumptions around which uh, books, you know, as a whole are constructed. Mm -hmm. And they bleed across um, art and, you know, literary worlds as well. So I think this this kind of plurality and this grey area was something that we were quite interested in investigating. Yeah. It, yeah. Also the circulation and reception of the book is quite different from that of a, of a I guess, conventional art object. So that, that was something that we wanted to think about as well. I, I think we took a lot of references also from or, or from our own understanding of, of artist book production within especially Southeast Asia as a region um, and our own personal encounters with these books because um, and, and we realised that artists I mean there were artists within Southeast Asia who were also looking at, at production especially Indonesia and Thailand who were looking at more smaller scale production on their own yeah. um, coming up with zines uh, we, we consider those artist books as well you yeah. know like um, and it's really up to the artist to define what, mm. what they think the parameters are right so um, and we realised that these these forms of production um, were very common uh, or it became something that not only um, it, I, I think sometimes it start, starts off as more of like a I would say um, maybe an accompaniment to an exhibition so like a like just a supporting role to suddenly you know kind of surfacing up to a little bit more of a equal role of the exhibition and then after that it becomes um, even just the book as a standalone uh, object yeah so I think that was um, something that you observed as well yeah. mm. and I think what we were quite interested in was the fact that in Singapore um, there are definitely artists who have had uh, an inclination towards making artist books but we felt that a majority of them were concentrated within the realm of photography so I think we wanted to expand um, you know art books to encompass uh, artists who were practicing in mediums that weren't necessarily uh, immediately or comfortably associated with um, something two-dimensional like photography uh, in order to see you know what what this might produce so it was a very kind of open-ended conversation and process mm. like from the, from the get-go mm. yeah. the process began with a series of conversations with each of the artists and everyone kind of had more or less the same starting point where uh, you know, it was really a conversation first between uh, the artists and you know, myself. And then from there, you know, we would go in currency um, into the discussions. And that's where you actually see that the paths uh, begin to diverge, where the artist's interest in form, in text, or in image uh, really start to take very distinct um, paths or trajectories. Um, and I think that that was precisely what we were envisioning. Mm. An uneven kind of array of approaches. Yeah, it's, it's quite cross-disciplinary in a way whereby, I mean, most of them you would regard as, as visual artists, but they work with very different mediums. Uh, like, for example, Nina works with, I mean, her background is in choreography, but she also works with text, with visual, mm. um, and then, but, uh, and then most of them work with materials as well. So it's, it's different kinds of mediums that get, they get pulled in. Um, and yeah, Ian, for, for instance, um, is known primarily as a painter, uh, but we first approached him partly because you know, we were very intrigued by a lot of his artwork titles, which were very poetic and seemed to draw from this, um, well, inner kind of reference or repository of, of meaning. Um, so that was part of that first cut of us working through possible materials that we would include for Ian. But eventually, you know, we also we also want to share that yeah, some things also um, didn't make it into that final book, and these decisions were always jointly made um, with the artist, kind of more or less making that final call as well. Yeah, so 
that process of you know editing selection was was also something gradual, but but deliberate, um, and also allowed I think for a lot more room for the artist to play I think with forms of of making or 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 sequencing uh, that may or may not be. Um, so so visible or so so foregrounded in their in their kind of like day to day practice. Yeah. So I guess starting starting on a project like browsing copy, it's not just about preparing uh, the development process with the artist, but also to get a sense of how you may want to uh, present it, and mm-hmm. therefore the book fair and also the launch uh, with programming is something that is part of the the, the start starting point of the project. So um, the group of artists in the project are. As you mentioned, very diverse in in what they are interested in. Mm-hmm. Um, I would just like to know uh, how how do these artists actually begin uh, their work on the book? Um, yeah, I think as we mentioned, uh, you know, as when it begins, it's it's really um, uh, what I think Sunil and I try to set up is um, a conversation that doesn't have so many limitations or restrictions in place yet and we really hear from the artists about you know, certain ideas or images that have been um, percolating or have been you know uh, inscribed in, in their practice uh, uh, but may not have been uh, so visible uh, at present. Um, for example, um, Susie Wong, um, she, she's someone who's known as a painter but also someone who has organized uh, many performances and also written um, extensively uh, as an as an art critic. So you know, for this book, um, the idea of the coconut, uh, it's really about her locating certain popular images that uh, perpetuate the idea of the tropics as exotic and as um, savage as well. Uh, so for for Susie, I think you know she's been drawing upon these images in her work uh, through drawing, sketching, um, and sometimes even uh, painting and printmaking. Um, but yeah, use creating you know, um, a sequence of images using the book form uh, to, to, to kind of regulate uh, the experience of looking at them was something that um, she hadn't explored before. And so you can see that it really draws upon a variety of kind of filmic stills um, and also uh, the use of uh, materials that were also introduced and suggested uh, by currency as part of the kind of collaborative conversation uh, in order to um, suggest you know or evoke uh, certain tropes that uh, Susie has kind of identified in in these um, kind of artifacts of popular culture um, over time and I guess the process of working on Susie's book was also quite interesting where um, she was very open also to working very closely with um, currency to develop um, you know even things like the format the finish um, the layout um, alongside um, the designers so it really spoke to uh, the way in which you know design is an undeniable aspect of creating an artist's book um, and yeah, you can see this, this so-called uh, Mori effect. Uh, you know, it's really meant to kind of evoke the screen or the, the, the kind of CRT screen. Um, and I think this idea of an image being kind of filtered through pixels, the mediated image is something that um, has been an interest of Susie's for a very long time. But the challenge of, you know, doing creating this effect <laughs> using pieces of paper um, as opposed to, uh, you know, uh, digital technology was something that was also the product of many <laughs> late nights and long kind of chats and trial and error uh, between between all of us as well. Yeah. The, start, the starting point is also quite different from how you all work with Cole. Mm-hmm. So maybe you could share a bit of Cole. Yeah. I think for Cole, um, when the moment when we approached him, he immediately dived into a, almost like a, I would say a, a entire history of publishing mm-hmm. uh, in in Singapore, and uh, that was almost really that was that was really a learning experience for us as well because we we did not know about all this, and and 
it was he basically created this entire um, mini presentation for Darren and myself on the history of publishing as um, as derived from these um, these artifacts that he had found or you know like um, of of Xu Yunqiao who is a figure who was quite a renowned figure in, in publishing but also quite a quiet figure as well mm. so a forgotten figure so um, he I think he had come across these materials as part of like a, the move of one of the clan associations or Hui Kuan yeah. um, and, um, and they left a lot of the materials behind and I think Ko was invited to also just kind of peruse mm. and see if there was anything that, that um, might be of, of interest to him and, and I think that was great that he picked these up as well because mm. um, if you look through the entire box of, mm. of his for his book uh, you see all these um, again these different elements that come together so there, there's a mix of images that he had taken mm. uh, when he visited the place uh, before their move I think he, mm. out of the Ayer I think yeah. Um, and then after that, um, also all these um, reproductions of, of publications from the Nanyang yeah. um, era. That, is that, Nanyang? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That Xu Yunqiao had helmed, in fact, yeah. as the editor. Yeah, it was fascinating in the sense that Mr. Ko, as an archivist, almost acted as like this portal mm. for Xu Yunqiao to come to life um, through you know a series of almost like uh, chants chance um, operations um, but yeah so I, I think this even how it's laid out um, this is something that was again uh, uh, suggested but also supported by Mr. Ko uh, su suggested um, by currency to you know evoke that sense of um, how these materials were found which was literally in, in these types of spaces where uh, material wasn't necessarily neatly organized um, you know, this material was often like abandoned or left because it was seen as of uh, lesser importance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so I think, you know, being able to create this dossier uh, as opposed to um, a typical kind of bound book um, was something that was very uh, important to, you know, um, constructing this idea or enacting this gesture of Mr. Ko as an archivist as well. I think just to continue on from what Jai was mentioning about um, Ko's book, um, it, it was interesting also because it, it functioned almost as a, a quite a useful tool for him to fulfill his role as archivist, artist. Like um, I, I recall when we were showing the, the books um, at both the um, the program launch as well as the Singapore Book Fair, Ko was constantly like next to his book and using it, you know, like he was narrating it, using it as a tool to to speak about that history of publication uh, or publishing that he he had shared with us previously as well. But now he has this this you know side tool for him to 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 na navigate that history. So I th I think that um, again, just going back to the point that this was a way for it's not about getting artists to conform to the vehicle of the book, but really just to think about these entry points, right? That would maybe aid in their in their practice as well. So I, for Ko, I think that was quite a significant. Um, thing first to, to observe. So, you know, for Ko, you can see how, uh, as Dean mentioned, you know, the book really becomes a vehicle or a tool um, to, 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 for him to talk through this like corpus of material um, and point to a history that is almost kind of slightly outside of his own history as an artist. Um, but on the other hand, you know, with, with Sukun Ang, um, who we worked on also for opening day, uh, she actually uh, is revealing a very different um, approach and interest in, 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 in making use of the book form. Um, and here you can see that it's it's a pop-up book, uh, which, I mean, I think she had in mind to make uh, for nearly 10 years. So when we actually first approached her, she already had this idea that, you know, this was what she wanted to do. Um, in order to, yes, there's a flat demonstration, <laughs> to, to kind of emplace her, her sculptural works, some of which are models, some of which are finished works, um, within this kind of almost uh, galactic kind of imaginary landscape. Um, and I think this idea of placement or displacement um, or an imaginary kind of field of vision is something that is very uh, central to Sukun's uh, uh, practice, um, not only as a sculptor, but also as someone who's interested in um, performance um, and other types of making. Mm. Yeah. Like most of her works, um, 
So I would say that this book is also quite very much derived from her, her sculptural works, right? So uh, where there are physical objects with metaphysical connotations. So that's something for for. So I think that was something that we tried to surface together with her. Uh, if you look at say the 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 design of the surfaces that we are looking at here for each page, uh, the background in which the sculpture sits. So whatever you see that's popping up is her. These are like her works. But then the background was was uh, designed together with her and understanding a better understanding of how she wanted to have them um, sit within an environment. Mm -hmm. So these these sculptures also kind of evoke a different reconsideration of the sculptures in terms of its uh, change in scale and, and approach in size. And um, it, yeah, I, I, I would I would say that the way that she alters the dimensions of, of and juxtapose all these like, you know, quite unlikely objects together within a single page is also a way of, of playing mm -hmm. around with, with how she usually approaches mm -hmm. um, these works. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I guess it, it may or may not be obvious from what you can see, but making a pop-up book wasn't something that was part of our <laughs> daily competency. So, yeah. so we really also had to figure out from scratch, particularly currency, you know, how, how a pop-up mechanism works, uh, what, what kind of grammage the paper needs to be in order to support the images, um, you know, how, how the kind of flaps and folds uh, interact for it to actually successfully close um, safely as a book. Yeah, so, so all of these discussions were taking place even as Sukun wasn't based um, in Singapore, mm -hmm. um, which, which also meant that you know, we had to also uh, create a system of trust and communication where we could kind of constantly work through uh, the final finishes and, and make sure that you know, the book is realized uh, in accordance with uh, what the artist was envisioning as well. So what was the process like of editing and selecting the materials for some of these art books? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I would say maybe start with Nina. Yeah. So for Nina, because she's got quite a... I mean, her background is in choreography, like I mentioned, in choreographic practice. So um, when we first encountered her, her practice, it was through uh, two different presentations. So one of the first one was at Peninsula, uh, like an independent art. Obviously, art space and studio, um, and um, and then later on, as of all starts, right? So that's also like another independent space, um, uh, artist run space. So um, for Nina, I think we were initially. So our first encounters with her with her work was were all these large posters with text on them, and uh, she had she had placed them around the the room or the the space uh, in such a way so that it follows the movement of the the visitor or like I would say. It, it's like vice versa because the visitor also follows the movement of the posters as they read uh, from one poster to the other. Mm -hmm. So she was also kind of um, inviting that 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 um, I would say interaction with the with the surface of, of the poster and also the text um, through her presentation. And we were quite um, enamored by that, and mm -hmm. we wanted to also think about and and that that made us think about the potentials of of how it would translate into a book form. You know, whereby it would be a definitely a lot more intimate you know it's something that you can hold and and mm -hmm. move along with it even more so that was when we first reached out to her that was the the starting point of the yeah. conversation yeah. um and then um when it came to selecting because uh i remember nina was was with us in singapore for the start of the project and then eventually she she moved overseas um so again it was also working remotely with her yeah. and she worked quite independently I would say because she had a very clear sense of um, there's a lot of text involved in her in her work and and because writing is largely quite a, a personal um, experience and, 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 and yeah so I our exercise and I would, so she, she we left her to her own devices quite yeah. quite a bit in the initial stages of her you know like um, plotting out these thoughts um, and then, then after that when it came to perhaps situating or locating these, these texts, you know, like around the page, yeah. uh, around the pages of her book. That was when we we came in. Yeah. So so it's again like trying to figure out together the artist what is a good good entry point for us um, to come in to assist or to to work together with her collaboratively. I recall that some of our earliest conversations with Luna were about this idea of dance notation yeah. and the fact that. Um, even up until today, there's no universal system like a musical score um, for notating dance. You know, what people do is send over a choreographer to teach a dance troupe, you know, how to execute uh, a performance. 
Um, so, you know, really, I think she was expanding um, and also challenging this idea of text as being able to um, suggest rhythm and movement. Um, but rather than a, a physical movement, I think, you know, what, what she really is orchestrating, sometimes not even with text, but with uh, notation is, you know, the orchestration of the viewer's eye, you know, moving across the page. And um, in a way, I think we were really impressed by the fact that um, when we when we first spoke to her, actually she had been looking at text um, as a as a medium for several years, but just hadn't found that that right opportunity to to express um, or test out uh, these ideas aside from you know the Peninsula show and also the um, kind of performance at at South Wall Studs. Yeah. yeah, I think it was also through Nina that we. We found, um, I mean, she recommended or she, she suggested a lot more references and we looked at them together, like yeah. Paul Chan's Badlands yes. Unlimited, um, which is also his own publishing yeah. um, arm of his practice, right? And then also um, Jason Dodge, yeah. who, who is um, overseeing this entire series of poetry publications. Mm. Uh, and then, um, and also in the book, you will see that she's included uh, certain pages or screenshots. Um, Certain pages and screenshots from this film by Agnes Bada um, on on the Black Panthers, yep. Black Panther movement, and um, this was a very significant inclusion because uh, it, sorry, I mean it was this, this inclusion was was um, interesting first because it was a significant point of reference that she had brought in or introduced when we're thinking about the the size of the book. Yep. So like um, she was she was quite taken by say for example these. Um, um, members of the Black Panther movement carrying these, so there was there was scenes of them, you know, uh, walking around or mm. or lying on the grass uh, patches, you know, just with the little red yeah, book. with the little yeah. with the mouse little red book yeah. um, sticking out of their pockets. So that was she she really uh, she really understood the portability of of mm. that and and felt that that was something she wanted to translate into her own publication as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah I think Ian provides like quite a nice. Kind of contrast uh, departure from from Nina's approach because uh, primarily you know Ian is known um, as a painter and that's in a way what the cover is a little bit of a kind of tongue in cheek tribute to, which is uh, the kind of underside of a stretched canvas that normally uh, you don't see in a kind of conventional painting, and I think this these two images are actually bookmark some of the earliest uh, working sketches that we saw uh, upon our first meetings with him and I think really helped to also bookend this sense that uh, what you see um, in this book is like a series of uh, processes um, and a series of suggestions that are drawn not only from a digital painting which I think he's very seldom um, exhibited but actually in fact these photographic references that um, aren't so often or almost never included in exhibitions of his work, uh, which focus almost exclusively on his uh, work in painting and uh, in graphite or in pencil. Yeah, I think the the images that that are featured within the book um, gives also a very good. Uh, in, idea of the way that he, he thinks about perceptual abstraction which is really like the underlying um, I would say inspiration for his work as mm -hmm. well so um, that's something that he looks at and and for us that inclusion into this this book was really like Jai mentioned uh, almost acted as a, a compilation of, of Ian's stream of consciousness as well yeah. um, into this into this book yeah. Yeah. And, and you can see that you know, there's actually a lot of pairing and juxtaposition happening and these actually weren't by chance, these were very much uh, deliberately uh, designed and laid out uh, to kind of create um, or imply, I guess, a, a visual flow. Um, and that very much also is thanks to you know, currency's uh, accommodation, I think, of, of a certain uh, exacting kind of um, approach towards uh, laying out images uh, that you know one would also expect of someone who's been painting uh, for, for such a long time uh, like Ian so but a lot of this manipulation rather than happening on the canvas was happening you know in InDesign um, where the layout of every single one of these images and, and the kind of corresponding colors 
or the, the lack of corresponding colours was uh, you know, weighed out as, as a kind of a decision. Um, so, um, as mentioned earlier, you know, um, text figured in our early um, kind of, uh, well, conceptions of what the book could be. Uh, but eventually, you know, they, they were kind of, uh, they, they, they kind of like fell through the sieve, I guess, as, as we were working uh, towards that kind of final uh, book product, which became purely a almost kind of visual essay. Um, yeah. yeah. What about Yu Tong's book? Yeah, so Yu Tong's um, um, project, well, basically this, this project is a series of eight, eight mini projects. So for Yu Tong, I think um, we had worked with him previously for uh, opening day as well. And, you know, when we first approached him about uh, this book, he was very interested in a series of quotidian images uh, that had been taken from his daily life. Um, as you can see, um, they are printed quite small. <laughs> and uh, thumbnail, size. thumbnail size. And you can also observe that not every page um, has an image. And I think with with Yitong, even though um, it almost defies the conventional wisdom of an image as providing information, as being legible, um, as, as providing, you know, like a, a thousand words uh, in one picture, it's almost that precise, you know, convenience that um, Yitong wanted to challenge uh, through the book. Um, and I think you know, we, we, we had so many conversations um, also about how he was seeing uh, the book form. And you can see that um, of all eight books, you know, this has a particular heft, um, which is also uh, by design. Yeah. yeah. I think the irony of it is that like, uh, you know, Yitong was working largely with these, uh, what he calls throwaway images, right? Because I think when we, we started discussions, he, he, he showed us all these, you know, like he was pointing or referencing these images that, you know, all of us take about with our iPhones or like our phones mm -hmm. in, in general, um, you know, pointing at things to like, you know, show, are we going to buy this? Are we, are you referring to that kind of um, building? Or, mm -hmm. you know, like if I, if I saw something, I'll take a screenshot of it. So all these images that we accumulate over time in our, in our mobile devices. And he was interested in the fact that like, it was taken without any form of, I guess, aesthetic consideration. And he had like, over time also for himself accumulated a whole series of these images. And he was thinking through like, what is the, the way in which he, he would view them or perceive mm. or, 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 or I guess process them for himself. The heft actually was, was something that was so intentional on the, on the lens of design. Um, because I remembered he wanted also a book that isn't easy to read and that was something that he wanted to as an artist challenge the readers and so he wanted the images to not be something easily uh, thumb or yeah. browsable mm -hmm. so we were working with him to kind of arrive with the fact that uh, at certain placements of on, on a page you would have to really open the book and flip it in a way whereby when you thumb, you cannot find, you cannot see the images. But if you are flipping page by page, you would then be able to find it. So it's it's very close to the gutter mm. of the book. It's here. Yeah. And not only that, it doesn't appear on every page. It actually, it appears randomly, mm. and that also makes uh, it even harder to find the images. And therefore, you cannot thumb it through because you won't be able to catch uh, the images. Actually, you would only be able to do that if you are turning page by page. Mm. Yeah. So it's almost a little bit like a defiance to the ways in which, you know, images upon the thousands are available to us um, by, you know, any number of screens these days. Um, and yeah, this, this really almost slows the process down um, and makes you also consider, you know, the value or um, the difference uh, between information and, and image. And I suppose in terms of uh, format, another kind of less conventional book form that uh, you know we were able to think through was uh, Ryan Ben Lee's mm. um, accordion folk book. Um, yeah, so this, uh, well, the, the process, the format is also, again, the product of uh, long conversations. Some of Ryan Ben Lee's uh, filmic works 
stop motion animations, uh, both online and also um, in exhibitions. And I think we were really fascinated with the fact that you know, he was studying experimental animation. Um, and that just seemed to already suggest a, um, a very different set of parameters around image making where you know the two-dimensional uh, gives form to a new temporality through something really simple and analog uh, like the flip book um, but then the challenge was that you know because he's already making uh, so many different kind of experimental films and and also you know flip books uh, or, or animations uh, as part of his curriculum you know how would this book then push that boundary further. Since we are talking about working with printers to develop the books, I would also like to add about other production aspects of some of the books that we've talked before. Mm. Um, so for example, for Coles, uh, a fragmented history of publishing in Singapore, um, we wanted to reflect the sense of fragments and the fact that it's almost like a found box. Uh, uh, especially when we were looking at his archives, there were a lot of uh, uh, way in which he keeps his material that are not, you know, usually very new. So he wanted to reflect that through the kind of uh, fabric wrap. And so this, this idea of um, almost very kind of like furry edged uh, way in which we slice up the kind of uh, fabric was something that we had to really map out for the printer to do. And they were quite confused at why we wanted to hot stamp over this messy looking kind of um, um, a layout. And we also had to, as much as it looks very random, and there are no two boxes that are the same, um, we had to also kind of almost to the MM and to the point, uh, decide where some of these uh, uh, fabric uh, pieces actually sit. So it kind of looks very random, but actually these are very, very uh, specific locations because they actually kind of layer such that we can use the least amount of fabric to cover the amount of ground and to be able to also resolve some of the very practical ideas of wrapping through the whole uh, box as well. In a similar note, Ian's book uh, also deals with how we play around with the fabric wrap of a book. So this as you can, uh, as as Jia Yin also uh, mentioned just now about how the book also was kind of, was referencing a kind of like a canvas, a stretch canvas, uh, the back of it. Um, the book cover kind of uh, references that. But in order to achieve this uh, look, we actually had to reverse how books are actually wrapped on the cover. So this is usually how we actually wrap a fabric over a hard cover, uh, but it is kind of done in the opposite way. So actually this part is a separate fabric altogether because it doesn't work actually to reverse uh, uh, a wrap out because you, you don't have this spine to kind of uh, uh, kind of fix to the to the book block itself. So we had to kind of circumvent some of these uh, conventions and propose a kind of a way to kind of bring it together. And once uh, it's technically uh, possible. We had to kind of then propose it to the printer and they have to kind of understand uh, how to do it. Not so much why we don't want to do it. I think they will generally be quite confused at why we wanted to kind of like counter propose how it's traditionally been done. But we just wanted them to know like technically that it's possible and it can be something that they can do. Yeah, speaking of, you know, production and involving uh, KHL as a printing press, we have one book that isn't with us today, which is uh, Chua Tai Tik's uh, book. And that was the only publication out of the eight which did not uh, involve KHL uh, in any way, except for uh, it being an exhibition venue during the book launch itself. And designers. And designers. Oh yeah, it also did not involve currency. Uh, that's because um, Chai Tik's book um, is made out of pages that have been sliced from uh, tembusu wood. Mm. Um, they are not uh, traditionally bound uh, in any uh, form. And actually, so it becomes a kind of a, almost like a, a loose leaf assemblage um, of pages uh, that are made um, yeah, from this locally available wood. So, so yeah, as in for Tritic, it truly is a limited uh, edition in the sense of the scarcity of the wood. Um, that's 
available in the market uh, at any uh, given point in time. Mm. Um, yeah, so that was also, I think, a very interesting conversation for yeah. Samin and I. Mm. Um, because when we first approached Chaitik, uh, he was uh, moving a little bit away from uh, his photographic practice that had uh, preoccupied him for um, almost a decade or more um, and was really uh, invested in you know making a possible turn towards sculpture. Yeah. So even in the first instances of our conversation with him, uh, he was interested in paring down the physical experience of a book, which you know in, in a conventional sense is reduced to that simple act of turning pages. And he wanted to play with that with that gesture and with that action uh, through his work as mm. well. I think the initial conversations that we had with him, you could you could tell that he was very much focused on the form or the shape in which the, the book would take and less about the contents of it, right? And and that's also very uh, I would say emblematic of his practice whereby he, he's more concerned with say for example how it would feel in someone's hands what it would smell like even yep, yep. so there was I, <laughs> there were many readers who actually brought the book up to their noses and yep. to, to, to take a sniff at the tembusu wood because mm. it was such a rich colour and and, and, mm, yes. and steam yeah, yeah, yeah and kind of, scent yeah he had, um, also brushed it with some I think mineral oil mm. just to make sure that you know there wouldn't be kind of like these stray splinters flying but yeah, it was a very, uh, it was a great book to have um, as part of our uh, Singapore Art Book Fair booth. Thanks, thanks for today. <laughs> and I think it was really nice revisiting this project that we worked on a year ago. Um, I think we managed to at least verbally kind of document the process of art, artist books and how to make artist books. Mm. And hopefully it was useful for anyone who is uh, uh, developing their own. Um, and, and kind of like really looking at how actually all these eight books are actually very uh, different in, in how they started and how they were developed. And it's kind of nice to also, also get a sense of what went around the development of the eight books, um, uh, the pre presentation of it in the book fair and also in the launch. Um, maybe to kind of end off, I think it's kind of nice to hear as uh, people who organize, who had organized this project, Browsing Copy, um, what, are, what is maybe some thoughts that you would like to pass on to maybe artists or even curators who would like to embark on developing an artist book with an artist or an artist developing their own? Um, is there any kind of uh, thoughts on how, how they can proceed with one? I think one of the ways in which we can... Um, I, I think one of the ways in which uh, artists and, and curators can think about the book would be to um, perhaps see as the same or equivalent in value to the to an artwork or conventional artwork. So to query the boundaries of, of artistic production mm -hmm. through the form of a book, I think that is that is something to be encouraged. Mm -hmm. um, but of course understandably, you know, like the again, uh, like what we mentioned throughout the entire discussion was was really thinking about how we're very aware of how production in Singapore can be can be quite steep, you know, mm -hmm. like um, somehow the the economic like the the like economic the, cost test, yeah, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The economies of scale yes. don't really matter somehow doesn't really adjust itself, mm -hmm. you know, like mm -hmm. similarly to how our perhaps our South Asian neighbors yep. tend to encounter it. Uh but but then again this is the first project from us. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, that that could also be a determining factor, you know, like, yeah. as to as to the cost that, that was accrued out of this. Mm -hmm. But um but yeah that's that's one of my suggestions. Yeah. Um yeah, so I would just see for for any artists, curators, you know, thinking of working in print. I guess go in with your eyes wide open, um, but but also take it as a chance to see how you can work through these these barriers that are always imagined to be in place, um, in order to then generate and actually innovate uh, new new forms of, of making that um, can can still be incredibly precise and meaningful, uh, but but that yeah don't necessarily need to conform to these very typical kind of logistical and uh, economical uh, constraints that go into making exhibitions or even publications. Yeah. Thanks for watching and hopefully this session is useful uh, for you to develop your own book. So uh, thank, thanks for watching. Thanks, Thank thanks everyone. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Bye. Bye. Thanks, Melvin. Thanks, uh, Samir and Tia. Thank you for watching this episode of Art Books, A Beginner's Guide. 
If you have enjoyed this series, we would also appreciate it if you can fill in a feedback form that can be accessed through the QR code or link. We have also compiled a list of titles or texts that have been referenced or consulted on in the episode for your reading pleasure. See you next time. Thank mm-hmm. you.